Everybody, it's Principal Lou. Um, I just want you to know that I am monitoring the chat box. So please, if you have any questions, any wonderings, make sure that it is definitely appropriate, right? Um, but please sit back, enjoy this, the show, and then also, you know, have, have some things that you're thinking about because we do have our Castellar students here and they are going to ask a lot of really awesome questions to our special guest, Laura Ling. So, Ms. Wendy. Hi there, everyone. My name is Wendy Lau or Ms. Wendy to many of you kids out there. So before we begin, we want to acknowledge the Tongva people who were the original inhabitants of the land where Los Angeles and our school Castar is located. We honor the Tongva and all indig indigenous people past, present, and future. It's also African Her American History Month, and we honor the contributions of Black people and recognize that our country was built upon the labor of enslaved people. We also acknowledge the contributions of Black people to all areas of American life, including science, politics, the arts, and civil rights. We encourage, we encourage all of you to continue learning about underrepresented people groups in our country and the world. Happy Lunar New Year um, to all of you in the Castlear family and beyond. Welcome to our latest Faces Presents program where we try to introduce you kids to people who are doing inspiring things in their lives and career. I'm excited that my friend Laura will be here today, but first we have a few words from T. Mai or Ms. Mai, the president of FACES, friends and alumni of Castellar Elementary School. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Principal Lou, Wendy, Ms. Wendy, Eloise, Avalani, Isabella, and Ms. Laura Ling for being here with us today. I'm so grateful for your time and to be here on Zoom on a Friday with us. I am your FACES president this year. And as um, we all know, FACES is very, very passionate about our education through music program. And this year we were very lucky to get the, um, the grant for it, but we still need to continue to fundraise. These are the different places that you can go online, facescastellar.org. We do have a place there that you can find the donation link through PayPal. Right here we have the QR code. If that helps you, you can just Put your phone up to the screen. Every no donation is too small. And we know right now through the pandemic that music has been food for the soul. It has helped our kiddos. And it has been really, really nice to have Mr. B here, a familiar face through all the age groups, to unite us, to sing, to feel in harmony with each other. This has been incredibly, incredibly important and special. And we like to keep it going. And we know that these are difficult times, but anything that you can do will help our program. And you know, also, I wanna thank you for your help during our winter assistance food program. That was very, very nice. Thank you. We've been pivoting out to help in other causes, but education through music is our main one. And thank you to ETM for your continued support of the school. Thank you, Principal Lou, for your continued support of the program. And enjoy the program. Thank you. Today we're thrilled to talk with journalist Laura Ling, and I want to introduce our three student interviewers. We have Abilene and Eloise, who are in seventh grade, and we have Isabella, who is in fifth grade. And Abilene and Isabella have asked really great questions in past Faces Presents um, events, and Eloise is always willing to help us out. So um, the girls came up with really insightful questions for Laura. And if you kids out there have any questions for Laura, you can type them in the Q&A section and we're going to go over as many as we can. Um, at the end of the program, we're going to shoot to end around 545, 550. And for those of you who ask questions, we'll send you this like one inch Castellar pin. Okay, so think of good questions. And if we choose your question, you can um, just message uh, uh, Principal Liu with your address and we will send these to you. Do you wonder what it takes to be a news reporter or a host of a TV show? Laura Ling is an award-winning journalist and author. 
Laura will talk about her life and career, as well as investigating and covering hard topics that are important to her. In March 2009, Laura and her colleague Yuna Lee were captured by North Korean soldiers while investigating human trafficking on the Chinese border and released with help from former President Clinton. She wrote about the experience in Somewhere Inside, One Sister's Captivity in North Korea and the Other's Fight to Bring Her Home, a memoir she penned with her sister and fellow journalist Lisa Ling. Recently, Laura has hosted the Everyday Bravery podcast and Discovery mini documentary series, The Power of Kindness. She has also worked for E, ABC, NBC, KCET, PBS, and Current TV. And now we are honored to introduce you to journalist Lara Ling. Hi, everyone. Hi, Castellar. Hi, Abilene, Isabella, and Eloise. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, Miss Ling. Happy New Year. Thank you for coming to talk with us. Happy New Year to you. everybody. I love that we're all wearing our red for Lunar New Year. And is it a Castellar color? Is Castellar's color red? Perfect. <laughs> We're really excited and this will be a lot of fun. Hi, Ms. Lung. My first question is, were you a good student and what were you like as a kid? Thanks, Eloise. Um, I was a pretty good student, yes. <laughs> I, um, I loved school. I worked hard and I was kind of a teacher's pet, which might've been annoying to some other kids, but I was actually a really good student. And I think looking back on things, maybe I was a little bit too safe, kind of just stayed inside the lines a lot. And I might've benefited from just taking a little bit more risks and things that I do, did instead of wanting everything to be like just right. So um, yes, love school was a really good student student. Um, and what was I like as a kid? I was kind of a quiet kid. I was kind of reserved, uh, kind of a reserved kid. I grew up in a, uh, my, my parents were immigrants and they were, we didn't have a lot of money. So my parents worked a lot and they were working all the time to just help support our family. And so they didn't have a lot of time to take me to a lot of school functions or, you know, help me discover different kinds of interests or activities. And so I think because of that, I was a little bit more reserved and I, the TV was kind of my babysitter. Um, because my parents were just always working. They didn't have time to expose me to other stuff. Um, I love listening to music at home. I listen to like 80s pop, rock, new wave music, watched a lot of TV. And it's kind of funny because now uh, my kids complain because they don't get any screen time. <laughs> they get a little bit of screen time on the weekends. And I feel like I'm the chauffeur taking them to all of their activities. So I think I'm trying to expose them to things that I didn't have the chance to be exposed to. Many of the kids in our school are like you from immigrant families. Can you tell us more about growing up in a Chinese family? Sure. Well, I, so unlike you all, I mean, you all go to a school, I believe it's in the heart of Chinatown, which is so awesome and cool, I think, because you're just exposed to one Chinatown, which is such a vibrant place. And two, you're exposed to a lot of diversity, I imagine, which is also really amazing. For me, it was very different in that um, there were no Asian kids in my neighborhood growing up. I grew up in a neighborhood outside of Sacramento, California. And um, there were, I mean, just the smallest handful of, of Asian kids at my school. And so that made me feel different. And that made me feel maybe a little bit embarrassed at times. Like I, I was kind of embarrassed, my, I, was, I was made fun of. Um, kids would come to my house and these were my friends. So I know they didn't mean to be mean, but things that they would say were hurtful. They would say, oh, your house smells like fried rice all the time, you know, things like that. And it didn't make me feel good. And it made me just want to not be different. Um, and, and that was, I think I struggled with that a lot. And um, 
And so having parents from an immigrant family, like I said, they worked a lot. So I think that that allowed me to be more independent, do more things for myself. My sister and I kind of took care of each other. We were each other's best friends and we kind of looked out for each other. Um, but after I left for college, I went to UCLA. Um, it's where I met your Auntie Eloise, Auntie Angeline, and how I met your mommy um, when I went to UCLA. And people joke that UCLA is also known as the University of Caucasians Lost Amongst Asians, right? There's just so many Asians at UCLA, and it's true. And for me, that opened my eyes to a whole new world. And I loved it. It was so exhilarating to meet people that looked like me and that had been through the same experience and, and that I had growing up and, and not just Asians, but just people from all walks of life. Um, African-American friends, Latino, Latino friends, um, you know, gay friends. And that was, that was a real eye opener for me. And that was probably one of the um, more inspiring things about going to college at UCLA for me because it exposed me to so many different people and cultures and stories. And now I am, I would say that, I wouldn't say that most of my friends are Asian, but a majority of them, I mean, a lot of them are. And we just connect on a different level. And I'm just so proud of my heritage and my culture. Can I ask a follow-up question, uh, Laura? Um, you, you brought up a really good point about um, identity uh, because you were, you know, you were in a, uh, you grew up in an area that you probably were the only one that looked like yourself, right? Like there were other, um, it wasn't um, diverse in the sense that you saw uh, people mirroring what you looked like. Um, I'm wondering now going through the experiences that you, you have, what would you say or what kind of advice would you give to your younger self? Yeah, well, it's it's advice that I give to my kids who we, we also don't live in a very diverse neighborhood and they are half Chinese. And I just want them to be proud of who they are and, and to celebrate who they are and to appreciate um, the friends that they have and the, the, the cultural backgrounds that their friends come from, because they do have friends from different backgrounds. Um, and so I wish that somebody had kind of approached, talked to me and, and kind of inspired me to look at my identity from a point of confidence. And, and, you know, I, I definitely have that now. And it's something that I'm, I impart on my kids, but it was hard growing up because I didn't have that. Thank you. Again, there were no faces, right? There were no faces in the media to, to reinforce that, um, that pride in, in who we are as, as Asian Americans or African, African Americans or Latinx. And, and now we do have more of that. And I, so I think it's inspiring to see different faces and voices in, in the media of people that we can look up to. Also, your parents were divorced. Do you have any advice or encouragement for kids whose parents are not together? Yeah, so I was one of the few Asians in my community and one of the few kids of a divorced family in my community. So I really felt a little bit different and insecure. Um, and it wasn't, it certainly wasn't easy. And I know that divorce is much more common now. And I, I hope that people see it as, you know, every family is different and beautiful in their own way. But it is, it is a hard thing for for kids to go through. It certainly was for me. Um, I was sad and confused. And I think it's important to know that those feelings are okay, that th that is natural and normal. And, and, and it's, it's okay and understandable for you to feel sad, but hopefully you know that your parents love you. And hopefully you know that you can talk to your parents or your teachers or your principal about what you're going through. Because I think that having somebody to talk to and share those feelings and emotions with can really be helpful. It can kind of like help to get rid of some of those feelings from your body when you're able to just share and open up with somebody else. Can you describe what you do as a journalist and what made you want to be one? 
Sure. Um, well, as a journalist, I, I cover different stories and issues, and I tend to cover different stories about kind of like human rights and people that stories that aren't being heard but you know they're all different kinds of journalists they're sports journalists and music journalists um and you basically journalists are kind of storytellers we gather information we research stories we gather facts and we and we share that information to raise awareness about a particular story and hope that you know people will read or watch that story and feel like they know a little bit more about what's going on. And um, I, I remember when I was on my school newspaper in high school, I remember the first story I ever wrote for my high school newspaper. And it was about this electric tower that was going to be built really close to the school property. Actually, it was, I think it was on the school property. The school was going to lease some of their property for this electric tower to be built. And there was some controversy over that because they didn't know if that would pose some health consequences to the kids and to the teachers with this big electric tower on the school property. But then the school would get money because the electric company was gonna lease the land. So there was there was the kind of like these mixed feelings about this electric tower. And what was interesting is when I went out to go cover this story for my school paper, none of my friends knew about this electric tower and the controversy and debate over this electric tower. And I thought that that was really interesting to be able to talk to them about it, be able to share what was going on to get their opinions. And then when I saw that, when I saw that um, the story in print at the time uh, when I was in high school, it was an actual physical paper that they printed. And so when I read that, that article with my name on it, it just made me feel really good. And it made me feel really proud that I had somehow shared a story with my, my friends and my fellow students that they didn't know about that was, that was affecting their lives or could affect their lives. So that's kind of what, I don't know if that inspired me to go into journalism, but I've always really loved to write and to tell stories. How did you get started in journalism and what advice would you give young journalists? Well, let's see. I got started in journalism right after college, I but I started in print journalism. Like I said, I love to write. So I worked as a researcher for a writer for the Los Angeles Times. But I, my sister at the time who, um, was also, well, she, she was a journalist at the time. She was working for an educational news program that aired in schools actually. And so I always went to go visit her at her office and I loved what she was doing. So I really followed in my sister's footsteps. And then she left to go work somewhere else. And I, um, there was an opening at her, at this educational news program called Channel One News, um, looking for a researcher. And I, I decided to, and I knew people that work there. Um, actually, there's a producer named Mitch who I knew who asked if I wanted to come and, and um, try working out as a researcher. And I did, and I loved it. And what I loved about it was that this was TV. So it was video journalism. So before it was writing for the newspapers, but my friends weren't really reading the newspapers. My friends were watching the news on TV. And so it was, it was cool to be able to reach people my age through the medium that they were using, which was television. And then the internet came around and I started working in digital news. And that was that was really interesting working on news and, and stories that you could watch on the internet because that was a whole different experience and you could you know, read people's comments um, in and you could kind of get a more personal interaction with people. So I guess I've tried to work in different mediums um, telling stories and that's been really exciting because each medium where you work, whether it's uh, writing for the newspaper or TV or for the internet or maybe for a podcast or for radio. There's a different 
sense of creativity that you get and different challenge working in those different mediums. Where do you get your inspiration from? I get my inspiration reading a lot. I read a lot. I talk to, you know, when I meet different people and I really get a lot of inspiration from, I think the people that I meet. So a lot of the work that I do as a journalist is covering um, just sort of everyday people who are going through uh, maybe issues or struggles that people might not be aware of. And so these people inspire me. I've met so many um, incredible people with incredible stories who give me a lot of hope about what's going on in the world because you know they 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 are really strong and inspiring people. What are some important traits and qualities to have as a journalist? Good question. Well, people think that when you're a good journalist, you should have a lot of good questions prepared, which is true, but I would say you should also be a very good listener. Um, because, you know, you might have all your questions prepared, but when somebody is talking to you, um, that's something that's happening in real time. So to be able to react to them and to want to kind of dig into a little deeper. So just being a good listener. Um, I think that right now, um, journalism is kind of going through an interesting stage because there's a lot of misinformation going out there in the world. Um, so it's important to know your facts, really research your story and to, um, and to make sure that you're reporting on things accurately. So if you think about it, if you're a journalist and you're writing something and you don't check your facts and you put it out there, say on the internet, and somebody shares that story, and somebody else shares that story, and then somebody else shares that story. And then before you know it, millions of people have read that story. And so you can have a lot of impact, but it can have a negative impact if you're not being responsible about what you're sharing and not making sure that it's, it's an accurate story. Can I ask a follow-up question about that? Um, so you shared a really interesting point about disinformation, how, you know, as a journalist, you have this responsibility because it could be amplified in the, the totally wrong ways. But how about as the consumer, like what would the consumer have to do to be aware of, of that? Like, what are some, some things to consider? Yeah, so sure, like you, you students out there, I mean, you're working on your research projects that you have to do and you're you know, you're reading the news and you have to know now as just an informed person, you have to be a critical um, consumer of the media. So you can't, you can't take every, anything and everything that you're reading on the internet as a fact. So it's almost like you have to be your own investigator and you have to know, okay, well, where am I reading this? is this a reliable source or is this just somebody who kind of made up their own website who's telling me this information? And I'm sure your teachers are talking to you about what you know are more reliable and credible sources versus things that you might need to look a little bit deeper into, but it's really important now with so many sources out there, so many sources of information um, on the internet that we really, really be um, critical consumers of, of the news and media. How do you prepare and deal with nerves before you're about to host a show or report, or report a story? How do I prepare before with my nerves before I speak to a group like Castellar Elementary. So I get nervous every time. I even get nervous when I talk to you all. Um, I don't know if you you feel the same. I don't know, um, Avalini, if you were a little nervous before you started the Zoom. I know I was. And what I try to do before I report on a story is I try to prepare as much as I can. So if I'm working on a particular story, I'm trying to like read as much about it as I can, prepare my questions, just prepare everything. So that always felt makes me feel a little more comfortable because I'm not going into a situation completely blind um, and sort of winging it right then and there. But that doesn't necessarily help like the butterflies that I feel right before something, right? I can prepare 
as much as I, you know, prepare super well, but I still get those butterflies. What I try to do is I try to actually kind of close my eyes. I take a deep breath and I try to feel really get in tune to wh where my nerves are coming from. So is it my heart that's beating really fast? Do, do I feel like tension in my shoulders? Am I really sweaty? And I try to kind of um, focus on those areas. And I kind of just breathe into those areas. I breathe out of those areas until I feel like I've kind of like got a sense of calmness. Maybe I'm, you know, it's kind of like a little meditation. And then I also tell myself, I just say like, Laura, you can do this. And if something doesn't go right or if something's not perfect, it's okay. Like at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. It's fine. You got this. You can do this. So I kind of give myself a little pep talk. <laughs> How have your cultural identity and gender factored in your career? Well, you know, I think that as an Asian American woman, um, you know, I mean, I, I now I feel very in touch with and proud of my identity. And I also recognize that, um, uh, you know, as an Asian American woman, things aren't totally fair and just for uh, people like me. And so that has helped dictate me wanting to do the best that I can in my job um, and be a good example to others, but also to cover stories that can help sort of amplify the situation of say women and who may be coming from difficult situations, um, amplifying those stories about women's rights. I've covered a lot of different stories in Asia. Um, it's been one of my favorite places to work. So just trying to highlight stories in Asia, both some of the issues that are there, but also as well as what, you know, what a, what a wonderful um, cultural place place Asia is from, from a cultural sense. Can you talk about covering human trafficking, slavery, the energy crisis, and other heavy topics that are important to you? Yeah, well, I have covered a lot of heavy topics. Um, I've covered a lot of inspiring topics. Some of the heavy topics turn out to be pretty inspiring. I think what drives me to cover these stories is that, that there's a need to raise awareness about these stories. Um, when I covered the story about ed the energy crisis in Africa, that was a really um, interesting story for me. Um, there are um, tens of millions of people in Africa that don't have reliable energy. And so kids, um, often when they come home, their lights, they don't have, they can't just turn on the lights like you and I can. Um, and that means they can't study because it's pitch black. And sometimes it can be very harmful for their health because they, they study by um, kerosene lamps and it's just very dim. And they, so, so some kids walk, have walked for miles to find street lamps that are on to study underneath street lamps. And when I was researching this story, I actually, it was funny because we were having dinner one night, not funny, but we were having dinner one night with my family and I just shut off all the lights. And my kids went, what are you doing? And I said, you know what? This is what a lot of people in this world go through. And let's, I just want to experience, I wanted them to kind of experience that, um, to kind of try to put our shoes into other people's shoes. Uh, doctors are delivering babies in the dark. Some doctors are holding their cell phones to provide light to deliver babies. But what I found when I did that story, when I said that sometimes, you know, I cover hard topics and I feel like people need to know about what's happening. Um, but I also find the, find the hope and inspiration in those stories. So I met a young man who is a student who is, um, aspires to be a doctor and he is not going to let the darkness hold him back. He is just going to do whatever it takes to be a doctor and have a better life. And that doctor that I interviewed who delivers babies with her, with the light of her cell phone, she is 
continuing to do what she's doing. She's not letting that stop her. And so what I found was that, you know, the people who are going through, living through this crisis are, are determining their own destiny with their own strength. Of course they need help. And of course we, 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 um, should do more to help them, but they're not waiting for our help. They are going to make this happen and they are going to be successful and, 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 and use their strength um, to get them through the situation. Tell us about being held captive in North Korea. How did it change your life? Well, um, it was a very scary situation. So I was covering a story about um, human trafficking and, and really people that are going from one situation uh, to try to find a better life, right? So we we experience, uh, we're experiencing that situation at our border and, um, you know, a situation that has similarities are, are happening at the uh, Ch Chinese border with North Korea. And I found myself in a pretty scary situation um, where I was held there in North Korea uh, for many months. And uh, it was, it was the scariest time of my life. Um, but it was also a very eye-opening experience in that I, um, I came back from the experience with a huge sense of gratitude because at some point in my life, I thought I might not get to see my parents ever again. Um, that was really frightening for me. And so now I kind of look at these little things that normally we might take for granted and I really appreciate those things. So even just like taking a walk outside um, is something that is kind of a treasure for me. And there's something that I do every night. It's something, it's, it's kind of a little ritual tradition, like a ritual in my life that I like to share with people um, because it helped me. So I don't know, maybe it might help you. And when I was in that situation and I was very scared, um, there's something that I would do every night. So I would sit cross-legged before I went to sleep and I would think about three things that I felt grateful for. And, and they, were, they might've been really little things. Like I saw a butterfly outside the, outside the window. You know, It might've been something like, oh, I heard music today. And so it's something that helped me get through to the next day. And it's something that I do every day to this day. So every day before I go to sleep, I think about three things that I felt grateful for in the day. And that sort of makes me feel a little bit better about whatever I might've been going through. And it helps me kind of prepare for the next day. Um, so that's, you know, that's something kind of a bright spot that came out of a very scary situation. I'll tell you something else that came out of that situation was friendship. So when I was held in North Korea by myself, all across the you know other side of the the world i knew i did get some news reports i got some letters and i knew about different vigils that were taking place um, and my friends who went to those vigils or organized those vigils including eloise's mom wendy um, and i knew about that 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 was happening and i also knew that complete strangers were going to those vigils for me that gave me a lot of strength. I'm actually getting a little emotional right now. Um, but knowing that my friends, friends from elementary school that I hadn't talked to in years were out there trying to help me, that really gave me strength, but it also um, taught me about friendship and the power of friendship, right? So you guys, you're in fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. So these friendships that you make at Costellar, these, you know, these, some of these friends that you meet and make at the school are gonna be your friends for life. And you may not always keep in touch, but these people are gonna be there for you. And it taught me about the power of friendship and the importance of being a good friend. Thank you for such um, powerful words, Laura, about being, you're just such a positive, positive person and being able to just, you know, like letting our students understand and know that, you know, even if it could be very dark sometimes that there are 
positive lights that as long as we recognize them. Um, so thank you for saying that it, it it's uh, your words are really powerful right now. So thank you. Okay, well, good. Listen, we all are going through tough times. It's a really tough time right now for us as a world, right? You kids are going through something that you shouldn't be experiencing, but you are and you're doing it with such strength. And I hope that you have found that even throughout these challenges, you can find those bright spots and it has made you stronger. And it's okay if you're feeling scared, if you're feeling sad to talk about those things, because guess what? We're all feeling those things and we can all help each other. Those words were just so encouraging. And um, and just a little plug for your book that I have here that I just reread about the whole experience in North Korea for older advanced readers, probably seventh grade and beyond. And when you get older and for your parents out there, definitely pick up the book that Lisa, uh, that um, Laura wrote with her sister, Lisa. They, they did a signing at the giant robot store, remember? Yes. That's where we got this. Still have your Hi, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super close to my cousins Mila and Lucia and we're like sisters. We're also in the same van with our friend Bella and we all inspire each other to keep writing and practicing. You and your sister um, are best friends and are very close and you guys also have similar careers. How do you inspire and encourage each other? Oh, thanks Eloise. I'm such a Linda Linda's fan. Um, and I'm so... Video. What's that? Thank you for being in our vote video. Oh my gosh, it was my honor to be in your video. It was so great that you were using your voice to get people to get out and vote. And I was so happy to be a part of that video. So thank you for asking me. Um, my sister and I are best friends. We talk to each other multiple times a day and we know that we're always there for each other. I mentioned that our parents were um, divorced and they were working all the time. I mean, listen, we have a great relationship with our parents, um, very close to our mom and dad. But when we were growing up, it was kind of, we kind of felt like it was the two of us and we were kind of helping each other, helping each other along the way. And so that's, I, that's one of the reasons why we have such a strong bond. And we, we, if she needs anything, she knows I'm there for her and, and vice versa. And it's so great that you have that relationship with your cousins. Um, and it doesn't have to be right. It doesn't have to be a sibling. It doesn't have to be a family member. I, I you know, as I mentioned before, like friendship can be so powerful and you can find those bonds in a lot of different ways. So I'm glad that you have that with your cousins. Who is the most famous person you've met? And have you ever been starstruck? <laughs> um, well, let's see. I mean, I haven't met a ton of celebrities. I, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of my job is meeting people who are actually the opposite of celebrities. It's people who um, are really like don't, whose voices aren't being told. And I feel like it's been, you know, my job to help share their stories. Um, but, you know, I mean, I've interviewed some world leaders of Kofi Annan, um, Burmese leader Aung San Suu Kyi, President Clinton and others, um, Khloe Kardashian, maybe you guys know her. I'm trying to think of younger <laughs> celebrities that you might know. Um, Steven Tyler of Aerosmith. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't, who's, who's not young, but I don't know if you might know him. I don't, I don't get particularly starstruck, but I do respect people who have worked really hard and are passionate about what they do and that are sharing their talents with the world. So I get excited to, uh, I got really excited to see Eloise because I'm really proud of her and that she's following her passion in music. <laughs> so if I'm starstruck with anyone tonight, it's probably Miss Eloise. <laughs> what are some of your most recent stories and how has the pandemic affected your work? Uh, the pandemic has definitely affected my work. I mean, when the, when the pandemic um, struck in February, March, I started losing a lot of projects. A lot of projects got canceled, put on hold. That was hard, uh, but it also allowed me to spend really, really quality time with my kids because all of a sudden they were home. I have a 10-year-old daughter and a seven-year-old son. And so um, in some ways it was a really special time to be with them. Uh, right now I'm working on um, 
a series of um, shows that I probably can't share with you right now, but um, but they're they're uh, one of them is pretty cool. It's it's kind of celebrating artistry um, and creativity. And um, before the pandemic, this was a this was maybe a couple years ago. I worked on a documentary about the power of kindness, which is really a cool project to to work on because we looked at how kindness, how random acts of kindness can benefit. Obviously, benefits the receiver of those kind acts, right? But also really benefits the giver of those acts and how, how simple acts of kindness can really change people's lives. And one of the things that I did um, for that project was we actually looked at it from a scientific perspective. So I went and they, I got hooked up uh, with a bunch of these like nodes and these, these, these nodes were able to um, test my vagus nerve, which is a nerve in your body that's sort of connected, that, that triggers, um, your, your gut area, your brain area, but they were able, they showed me images that were, that were supposed to kind of trigger my feelings of empathy. And they looked at how that affected my vagus nerve. And, and they say that kind of triggering this nerve can be really good for your health. And they, you could actually see the monitors kind of when my, when I was feeling a little bit more empathetic, when I was um, when these images were in front of me, how it affected my body. And so scientists are out there, they're researching, how does kindness, how does empathy and kindness actually affect our health? So that we're when kind, when we are kind to people, it actually makes us healthier. And I'm not saying we should be kind to people for selfish reasons, because we might live longer, but it just shows that there are benefits to everyone involved. And you think about it, I mean, you, when you actually confront somebody and they, it's something as simple as a smile, that makes you feel good, right? And so I think that, you know, right now, we really need a good dose of kindness in this world and little things that we can do by, you know, smiling more or helping our friend, helping our neighbor, all those little acts can go a long way in both helping them and helping ourselves. Okay, I have a parent related question. And, um, you know, I actually have a funny uh, little story about Laura. So we know each other through my sister-in-law, Angeline, and we were, um, meeting up with a bunch of new mommies when our kids were babies, but Laura was the only one who didn't have kids. So she would just come and listen to us, you know, gossip about our husband and, and kids. But um, anyways, that, that was kind of funny. So, um, but I wanted to ask you, um, as you know, Castar is located in Chinatown and most of our kids are people of color. Um, do you have advice for how parents can talk to their kids about difficult subjects they might see in the news, like um, like racism or hate crimes? Yeah, well, first of all, Wendy, you reminded me that I was the only person without a child at our girls' night out hangouts. I kind of forgot about that. And I think that it was because that you all were juggling kids and amazing careers that I wanted to hang out with a bunch of super women um, and try to draw from some of that energy because how you balanced it all was really just so, so inspiring. Um, especially with like a little, little uh, tornado like Eloise. <laughs> Um, we, you know, I think we all feel that we are going through extremely difficult times, not just with this pandemic, but how it has impacted um, the Asian American community. And we have seen um, the increase in hate crimes over the past year just skyrocket. And it is, it is, it's devastating and it's, and it's, it's, it's infuriating really. Um, as a parent, I think that we're all navigating how to talk about these difficult subjects with our kids in our own ways and what feels right for, for us and for our families. For me, um, I'm pretty honest with my kids about what's going on. We talk about issues of uh, freedom and discrimination and race and hate um, from a lot of different perspectives, from a historical perspective. Um, from what's going on in the world today. And so I think having those conversations, reading books 
about um, racism is, you know, one of the uh, more helpful ways to do it. Um, and just kind of being open and honest. And I think really, I mean, this is a time when we need to be extremely proud of who we are. And for a long time, you know, Asians and the Asian community has been stereotyped as being kind of silent and, and a little bit more submissive. And we, we need to change that. You know, we have contributed to the success and growth and prosperity and, and of this country in so many ways. I mean, right now during this pandemic, our people from our community are doctors, nurses, people in the front lives, lines, saving lives. We are part of this democracy and we need to look at our freedom and our liberty not just as a right, but as a responsibility, um, because we have the power to affect change, not just us as adults, but as kids. You know, kids can and and they and and look at Eloise and what she was doing to get out the vote, and and how inspiring that was. From using your voices to helping raising money to volunteering to writing to your politicians, there's so many ways that young people can get involved. And so I encourage us, us all to do that, to, to, to have real and honest conversations about what's happening, and then to approach it from a place of change and positivity and action. Thank you, Laura. Such great answers to all our questions. Um, I'm going to look over the Q&A real quick um, and see if we have any. Yeah, there's some good questions there. I got a lot of tearful moments. Thank you, Laura, and for the warmth. Oh my gosh, I have my tissue here, so. Yes, <laughs> and I just want you to know, my nose is pink because I feel the fellowship, and that's why we even having this Zoom is for representation, all the things that you're talking about, and it is so precious, your time right now with us. And to see everyone's faces here, and Isabella donating time at Lenny, Eloise, Principal Lou, Wendy, and us being here together, and hopefully for everyone out there, watching us you see yourselves you know you know that we can do this you know we've been working very hard to keep our school spirit alive you know and we are keeping our school afloat we have been helping each other we've been really really vigilant about that so thank you i had some good questions there miss wendy we have one from stella um which we kind of sort of answered this one but um what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the Asian American community today? today? Thanks, Stella. Um, yeah, people are not, you know, we're seeing that there's a lot of unkindness happening in the world right now. And um, people, there's a lot of blame for things going on. Um, people not treating the Asian community uh, fairly. Um, and it's, I think that that's, that's the biggest challenge. And another challenge is finding our voice and using our voice to, to come together, to um, you know, really, really fight, fight, fight back against these racist attacks. And another one from Daisy Oldberg, and um, she's asking specific questions about North Korea. Can you tell us about the conditions when you were in North Korea, in North Korean prisons, such as where did you sleep, what did you eat, and what jobs did you have to do? I mean, the conditions in North Korea, um, for those of you who don't know, I mean, it's it's one of the poorest countries in the world where there's not access to a lot of resources. Um, I was held in a facility um, by myself with a couple of guards. And, um, you know, because, because the country doesn't have a lot of resources, there wasn't you know, it was not, wasn't like there was heat and it was very cold uh, or hot water uh, or water to, to bathe. So conditions were extremely basic, but sort of, you know, bathing in a hot shower was the last thing on my mind. So um, I was fortunate to get three meals a day. The portions were very small, but at the same time, I felt lucky to get three meals a day when I imagine a lot of the population is um, impoverished 
And so I would kind of focus on those little things. Like I said, when I, when I had my ritual of gratitude, so I would focus, I wouldn't say to myself, oh, you know, the food they're feeding me is so meager. I would come, I would come from a perspective of, I feel grateful I got three meals a day when um, many North Koreans are going hungry. Um, so it was very, very basic conditions. Um, two guards looking after me at all times. And um, I feel fortunate that I was able to develop a kind of connection with some of my guards and to try to understand the uh, mindset of people who kind of looked at me as the enemy. Um, and I, looking at them with certain preconceived notions and um, some of those barriers coming down and, and, and opening each other's perspectives toward one another. The last question, what I think we'll just close this as our very last question is from Dean. What do you love about being a journalist? Hi Dean, um, thanks for your question. I love that I get to, I guess, you know, I started off talking about how I grew up in a very non-diverse community. And I think that that is um, one of the reasons perhaps that I wanted to go into journalism and then after going to UCLA and, and being exposed to so much diversity. So one of the things that I love are just the people I get to meet all around the country and around the world. People who are so completely different from me, um, from, from different places and backgrounds and cultures, and just to learn more about um, these different, learn more about our differences um, has open my eyes and sort of change my perspective on the world. So that's probably the, why I love being a journalist and why I, why I just pursued journalism in the first place. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Laura, for just being here with us tonight and for sharing your story and for um, just bringing uh, just uh, information and positivity to the world and to us. Um, so we just really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you for being so open and you know vulnerable and sharing that. And thank you to the Kessler community for coming together and know that with our strength is being unified with each other. We have the most diverse student body in all of LAUSD. And it is amazing that we are all working together. And um, we have, um, a few more faces events coming up after this so we will have an author and we will have um music producer and meetings so thank you everybody and continue to love each other love the school thank you bye everybody thank you bye thank you thanks for everyone's great questions thank thanks you bye 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 bye, bye, -bye. Here we go now.